Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Minister for Small Business. Minister. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Do you recall telling the House yesterday that Queensland Liberal State President Con Galtos was one of the two head office people who constructed the GST scam by requesting that tax invoices for the Costello dinner be forwarded to them as early as 21 November last year? Have you seen comments by Mr Galtos last night in which he absolutely denies your version of events, claiming that he first knew of the GST scam in January this year? Whoa. Minister, now that you've been caught out again, what version of the truth will you be telling today? Yeah. <clears throat> Leader of the Opposition. The imputation in the latter part of the Leader of the Opposition's question was inappropriate. The Minister for Small Business. Minister. Mr Speaker, I tabled the minutes of the November meeting of the Groom FEC on the basis that they made reference to the dinner, and I thought that it was appropriate to do so. The Honourable Member for Kalgoorlie. I thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Would the Prime Minister inform the House of the government's position in relation to the current status of MV Tampa and the people on board? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr uh, Speaker, the, I'm sure the House will be aware of the uh, circumstances whereby the Norwegian vessel uh, Tampa rescued 434 prospective unauthorised arrivals from their disabled vessel uh, north of Christmas Island on Sunday, the 26th of August. Mr. Speaker, having rescued the individuals, the freighter was proceeding to the Indonesian port of Marrick at the direction of the Indonesian Search and Rescue Authority. We understand that the freighter subsequently turned back to Christmas Island at the insistence of the rescued individuals. Mr Speaker, the government has requested the Tampa not enter Australian territorial waters and that it should continue on its original route to Indonesia. That position has been repeated, Mr Speaker, in exchanges between the Australian government and the government of Indonesia. We continue to seek the assistance of the Norwegian and the Indonesian governments to secure an acceptable solution for all concerned. Mr Speaker, I can <clears throat> confirm to the House that Australian personnel have been flown to Christmas Island by C-130 Hercules to provide any humanitarian assistance, such as food, water, medical supplies and safety equipment that may be required. A doctor on Christmas Island is available to provide medical assistance, and the government is in the process of sourcing a helicopter with winching capacity to transfer any necessary supplies or other assistance from Christmas Island to the Tampa if necessary. I have been informed, Mr Speaker, that the master of the vessel, and this has been the subject of some comment in the media this morning, the master of the vessel has not requested any security assistance from Australia in relation to activity on board the vessel. This vessel is a very large container vessel built in 1984. It has a very substantial capacity. It is partly a roll-on, roll-off vessel, and uh, the, uh, whilst the conditions on the vessel uh, would obviously not be comfortable, Mr. Speaker, it is a very, <coughs> very large vessel, and of course uh, significantly larger than than the, uh, many of the craft on the which uh, unassisted call. arrivals, unauthorised arrivals, have come to Australia. Mr. Speaker, I should also inform the House that the government has decided to deploy HMA as a runter uh, to uh, the Christmas Island vicinity. Uh, I understand it will leave Fremantle later this afternoon or early this evening, Mr Speaker, and uh, be within uh, the Christmas Island area within a few days. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Small Business, and I ask 
Do you recall telling the House last Thursday, and I quote, My understanding is quite clear. The Groom FEC books have been audited, and I'm informed that the auditor saw nothing untoward in the books. End of quote. And do you recall issuing a statement on Friday in which you backed this claim by reference to an auditor's report for the period to the 31st of March? Minister, why didn't you also acknowledge that there had been a previous audit by a different auditor, the Groom FEC's usual auditor, who did question arrangements for payment of the Costello fundraiser as a scheme? Minister, now that you've been caught out again, what version of the truth will you be telling us today? I'll invite the Deputy of the Opposition to rephrase the last part of the question in order to make a question to the Minister. The last, the last sentence. Well, I ask that uh, now that the Minister has uh, been shown to have been contradicted again, what is the truth of the matter? Minister for Small Business. The Minister. Mr Speaker, I made an extensive statement to the House yesterday. The Minister has the call. The member for Rankin, the Minister has the call. He's entitled to be heard in silence. The Minister will resume his seat. I have made it quite clear to the House that the Minister is entitled to be heard in silence, and I warn the member for Maribyrnong, who simply chose to continue interjecting. The Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As I was saying, in that extensive statement yesterday, I made reference to both those audits, and I stand by that statement. The member for Forest. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Can the Minister inform the House of diplomatic efforts Australia is taking to help resolve the issue of over 400 boat the people Chief on board Opposition the Norwegian Whip. freighter Tampa. Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, Mr Speaker, first can I thank the Honourable Member for Forest for his question and for his concern about uh, this, uh, this difficult issue. My department has been in close contact with both the Norwegian and the Indonesian authorities through the course of yesterday and overnight um, in an attempt to try to find a resolution to the problem of uh, the MV Tampa and its passengers. And this morning I also personally discussed the issue with the uh, Indian Indonesian ambassador uh, to Australia. My department and I in all of our discussions have made it clear that we are concerned to find an outcome which addresses the humanitarian uh, needs of the, uh, of the rescued passengers. But it is also critical for Australia that such an outcome protects the integrity of our immigration laws and our sovereign right to determine who enters this country. It is, Mr Speaker, important that people understand Australia has no obligation under international law to accept the rescued persons into Australian territory. I note that the fishing boat from which the 438 passengers were rescued in international waters set off from Indonesia and was crewed by Indonesians. After picking up the stranded passengers, and it's very important, Mr Speaker, to understand this fact, the Tampa was en route to the Indonesian port of Merak, where the passengers were to have disembarked. And the captain intended to have them disembark. The fact is, Mr Speaker, under a form of duress, the uh, captain of the ship was made to turn the ship around and make it head for Christmas Island. In these circumstances, Mr Speaker, we do not think it appropriate to succumb to duress. And uh, or, what is more, the entry of the rescued persons into Australia is neither reasonable nor lawful under Australia's immigration laws. In our view, the ship should return those rescued either to their point of departure or to the original intended destination of the ship, as would be the normal practice in these circumstances. 
Mr. Speaker, Australia is concerned about the welfare of those on board and, as the Prime Minister said in uh, answer to an earlier question, is providing humanitarian assistance to them, including food, water and, of course, medical attention. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question again is to the Minister for Small Business. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has the call. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ask the Minister, do you recall issuing a statement on Friday in which you said, and I quote, the Liberal Party did pay GST on the fundraising dinner. End of quote. Minister, given the Liberal Party claimed input tax credits on the Costello fundraiser, doesn't this mean it must also pay the tax office one eleventh of the income of the fundraiser? Can you confirm that the Groom FEC minutes show the income as eighteen thousand three hundred and fifty dollars? And isn't it true that the full GST on this amount is $1,668 and it was never paid to the tax office? Given that your version has been contradicted again, what is the truth of this matter, Minister? Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Member for Tre Treasurer. The Member for Rankin. Minister for Small Business. Minister. Mr Speaker, the Shadow Treasurer's understanding or lack of understanding of the tax system is absolutely breathtaking. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker. The Member for Groom and Minister for Small Business has the call. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I can confirm that the, red, the, the catering company involved was paid the GST in full by the Liberal Party. I have referred to this matter. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has asked his question. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Why don't you warn him? The Treasurer. Minister. Mr Speaker. The process that was followed is explained in detail in my statement, and I refer the shadow treasurer the member to for that Rankin. statement. Yeah. Member for Dunkley. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration, Multicultural Affairs, Reconciliation, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. Minister, does the government have proposals to deal with the issues relating to the management of illegal arrivals and people refused protection within Australia? Would the minister advise the House of any impediments to these proposals? The Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Minister. Mr uh, Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Dunkley for his question and, uh, of course, the answer in relation to each of the questions the member asked is, of course, yes. But the issue that we have to address here is why there are numbers of people who are prepared to engage in uh, quite inappropriate behaviour, to put captains of ships under duress, to uh, put officials of my department and those who are charged with assisting people here in Australia under duress, uh, what it is that drives people to behave in this way. Now, some would say um, that it is, of course, the desperation that some of these people face. But uh, the fact is that there are very significant differences in outcome, depending upon whether or not you are in Australia or making your claims elsewhere. And that's the point that I made. That's the point that I made yesterday. That if you have people from Afghanistan or who claim to be Afghanistani 
and may in fact be Pakistani, who come, of course, um, and who come without documentation, which we know they've had, and arrive in Australia and make their claims, they have an 84 per cent chance of being accepted, but if those same groups with documents are being assessed elsewhere, um, the assessments by the UNHCR are 14 per cent. 14 per cent. Now, that is a significant difference, and it applies not only to uh, Afghani, it applies in relation to uh, Iraqi, it applies in relation to uh, uh, Iranian, um, and, and that, is, that, that is the fact. And then you couple it with access to income support if people are found to be refugees, you couple it with access to universal health care, and you've got people who are in the business of people smuggling who trade on those factors, who now go out and advertise um, that we have reduced the time that people might remain in detention because we have been anxious to ensure that that period is as short as possible. Now, Australia does accept its international obligations and does so honourably. It exercises them conscientiously, but it does not accept that our refugee and humanitarian program will be managed by people smugglers. Now, I will be introducing today legislation that will ensure that the determination process is in accordance with our international obligations and is the same process that is applied by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. It will restore the intention of the Refugee Convention. It will also address those issues that have evolved from our jurisprudential model, that is, the extent to which the courts have determined that in Australia we will be significantly more generous in the way in which these issues are addressed. It will ensure that uh, in relation to those people who come without documents, that there is an onus on them to identify themselves in a meaningful way with verifiable documents, and if they don't, without just excuse, adverse implications will be able to be drawn. Now, these measures, coupled with some others, will be crucial to ensuring that we reduce Australia's relative attractiveness, not because we are being dishonourable and denying genuine refugees protection, but because people who are not refugees are able to gain it. And it will also be dependent upon containing the gratuitous advice as to the way in which the Convention is interpreted that arises through the jurisprudential model. And the opposition will have an opportunity this week or when we return to vote on the Judicial Review Bill. I heard the opposition spokesman saying that they are still opposed to it because it is unconstitutional. Oh. Well, look, if it is unconstitutional, let the courts throw it out. But what it would mean, of course, is that all the other privative clauses used by Labor governments from time immemorial to sustain the industrial relations system of this country would also be struck down. That's what it would mean. And uh, that's, that's the implication. But this is a matter in which, if it is to be a contest between the courts and the High Court of Parliament as Minister to the way the in which services. the law will be interpreted, if it is to be a matter of a contest between this place and another place and the courts, well, let it be at issue. But the fact is that on all the advice available to me, this bill is not unconstitutional. Yeah, yeah. Now, the further point that I'd make is that the cost of judicial review is growing exponentially, and this year it is in excess of $15 million. And 200 people in detention are awaiting the outcome of cases, despite decisions of the Refugee Review Tribunal. 200 people remain Member in detention right now right now because they are pursuing cases before the courts where they have already been found not to be refugees. And then we have the class actions bill, which the Labor Party is Minister opposing, where there are some 6,000 people involved maintaining themselves here in Australia on the pretext of being lawful because they are pursuing litigation as part of a class action. And uh, the fact is that there are over 600 unsuccessful 
refugee applicants that have already had their day in court, have already had their chance before the tribunal, who are using that system now to maintain themselves here in Australia. But uh, what I lament is the opposition that says we support 90 per cent of what you're about. We'll cherry pick. We'll cherry pick. We'll say which proposals, which proposals we'll accept, the which ones we'll accept, call. and then they say, but we'll 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 knock off the ones that we wish to. Member for Batman. And here we were the other day Member for in this chamber, in this chamber, Member saying for we Smith. support the measures that are designed to protect Australian workers who are managing detention centres from possible risks to their life and safety by being able to undertake searches to ascertain if people have weapons. And when that matter gets to the Senate, after you've given us a promise of support, you join with the Democrats and the others to send it off to a committee to delay the handling of the matter, and you won't, and you won't join us in ensuring that it will pass. Now, now, if you are serious order. in relation to these matters, member for Deakin, member for Blair, oh, you can't member for Denison, the minister has the call. The minister will address his remarks to the chair. Mr. Speaker, the member for Lyons. Um, if, if we are serious about these matters, there will be support for there will be support for all the of the for measures Patterson. that the government has sought to implement. Hear, hear. The, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my question again is to the Minister for Small Business. And I refer to statements made by him and his ministerial colleagues that the Groom GST scam was all a misunderstanding and has been fixed. Minister, isn't it a fact, as claimed by the Liberal Party stalwart David Watts, that at the very time that you were making this claim, the $826 in falsely claimed input tax credits was still sitting in the Groom FEC bank account. Hasn't your re-election account benefited from a GST scam the that, you the say, has the call. that you say was rectified months ago? Deputy Minister, Leader, Deputy Leader of the given that Deputy this is another version— Deputy Leader of the Opposition. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Minister, given that this is another version by you which has been contradicted, what is the truth of this matter? Minister for Small Business. The member for Rankin. The Mr. Minister. Mr Speaker, in my statement to the House yesterday, I outlined a number of steps that the Groom Division of the FEC took to ensure that it met its tax obligations. The minister has I the call. I stand by that statement. Member for Gray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Treasurer. Is the Minister aware of the result of the latest Yellow Pages Business Index released today? What does this survey reveal about the level of small business confidence and their view of the economy? The Treasurer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Gray for his question. Uh, I can uh, inform him that the Yellow Pages Business Survey was released today and it showed that confidence levels across Australian small to medium business improved markedly in the last quarter to the highest level since November of 1999. Mr Speaker, 61 per cent of small and medium enterprises feel confident about their prospects for the next 12 months. And the increase in confidence was reported across most uh, industries including hospitality, finance, insurance, communication, property and business services sector. And I think uh, all members of the House would say to see a return of confidence to small business is a good thing and welcome. Yeah. At least all members of uh, the House on this Member side for will Swan. welcome it, Mr Speaker. No doubt the Labor Party will be unhappy about small business increasing its confidence. Member for Patterson. But for the small business sector, that's good news 
And it, what it does is it reflects the fact that after coming through the, uh, the quarter, the December quarter, which was a negative quarter with uh, transitional effects to the new taxation system, after coming through the international downturn, a recovery of confidence is widely re being reflected in the Australian business community. Now, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Yellow Pages uh, also um, asks uh, small business uh, today uh, which party it believes is uh, better for handling taxation uh, matters. And I thought the, uh, the House might be uh, interested in this. Um, small business was asked which party they thought would provide a fairer tax system, and 16 per cent said Labor. 16 per cent, Mr Speaker. 40 per cent named the Coalition. Three to one. They were asked who did they think was the best for limiting tax for small business. And 11 per cent said Lawler. the Labor Party, Mr Speaker. 42 per cent said the Coalition. 42 to, to 11 per cent. Member uh, for Mr. Bruce. Speaker, they were asked uh, which party they thought uh, was the best for ensuring interest rates do not rise. 51 per cent said the Coalition to 5 per cent for the Labor Party. 5 per cent, Mr Speaker. 5 per cent. Five, you know, the number that supported the Labor Party was about a third of the Labor Party's maximum interest rate of 17 per cent, Mr Speaker. Uh, which was the best for controlling inflation? 61 per cent uh, was the, uh, the, um, the coalition. But this is the one I really liked. Uh, which was the Member best for, for controlling the deficit? For controlling the deficit. Deputy and, uh, Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, they always interject the loudest when they like the news the best. And uh, the uh, small business the member for Lawler. which was the best for controlling the deficit. Coalition 69 per cent, Labor Party 4 per cent. I, I, I don't know why the Labor Party only had 4 per cent, because well, that favourite clipping that I go to bed with every night from the Financial <laughs> Review includes in it the Labor Party's promise for bigger surpluses. And why is it that only 4 per cent of small businesses have got the message, when, after all, the Labor Party is going to roll back the GST, it's going to spend on the Noodle Nation, it's going to increase its expenditures on health? And it's going to do all of that with a bigger surplus. As I keep on saying, why didn't we think of that, Mr Speaker? I think uh, today is now probably uh, six weeks, seven weeks, since the Noodle Nation was released by the Labor Party. And I think in all of that time, Mr Speaker, we have not had in this House one question on the Noodle Nation Treasure since its release. Mr Speaker, not one question on the Noodle Nation, which is going to be the centrepiece of the Labor Party's plan for the next election. No questions this week on relation to health, Mr Speaker, which after last week's caucus meeting was going to be the great counter-attack from the Member Labor Party. Melbourne. No mention of education, no mention of the roll backwards either, Mr Speaker. Because, Mr. Speaker, these are policies of the Labor Party which dare not speak Member their name. Melbourne. It's no surprise that only 4 per cent of small business believes that Labor can control its deficits. In fact, Mr. Speaker, one would be surprised that it was even as high as 4 per cent in relation to this survey. Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Small Business. Minister, do you recall claiming yesterday that you didn't shut down the Groom GST scam because you were acting on the advice of Mr Neville Stewart, a member of the Queensland State Executive? Isn't it a fact that Queensland Liberal sources are telling everyone who will listen that Mr Stewart, along with Senator Brandis and Mr Santoro, was the architect of the GST scam that was being implemented in your FEC? And aren't these three people the shadowy figures who have been referred to over the weekend? Why didn't you disclose to this House that the person you relied upon in your defence was actually one of the culprits? Yeah, yeah. Minister for Small Business. Minister for Forests and Conservation. Minister. Mr Speaker, I'll check the record as to what I said yesterday. 
The member for Paterson. The minister has the call. Minister. The member for Rankin is warned. Minister. Mr Speaker, I'll check the Hansard as to what I said yesterday. In my statement to the House, I outlined a number of steps that were taken by the Groom FEC, and I stand by that statement. Member for Brisbane. Honourable Member for Riverina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Would the Minister update the House on how Australia's public health care system has benefited from the increase in the number of Australians who have exercised their right to choice and taken out private health insurance? Is the Minister aware of any alternative policies in this area? Minister for Health and Aged Care. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for Riverina for her question. Uh, I am aware that after the release of the exceedingly good uh, Private Health Insurance Administration Council figures, uh, there has been uh, uh, some criticism, particularly coming from the opposition, which is hardly surprising. The opposition seems unimpressed that uh, more revenue is going into the public hospital system from private health insurance companies. In doing so, they really miss the point. And that point is that for certainly the last seven to eight years, Public hospitals have lost an incredibly important revenue stream that had always been part of their overall operating budget. This was recognised by all state and territory health ministers. It was recognised by former Labor Party health ministers. Secondly, Mr Speaker, the health care agreements are worked out in many ways on the figures of uninsured population. Insured people tend to use public hospitals. As I said, yet, sorry, private hospitals. As I said yesterday, uh, the number of people not declaring their insurance status has dropped very dramatically. Uh, New South Wales is doing well in this respect, with uh, schemes reported to be in place for public hospitals to actually cover the gap, so that it will be more attractive for insured people to use public hospitals. If you actually look at funding going to hospitals on the basis of the uninsured population which uh, is how it has been traditionally looked at, we get some very interesting figures. Uh, I've got my department to take these out. I'm happy to table them. If you look in constant 1997-98 dollars, the fact is between in 1993, when Labor signed their last health care agreement, the average dollars per uninsured patient was 426. Over the life of the health care agreement that Labor signed, that went to $394 per uninsured patient, a decline to the states of 7.5 per cent. Compare that to 98-99, our first year of our health care agreement, $425 per person uninsured to the end of the health care agreement, 2002-2003, $592, an increase of nearly 40 per cent. So there's a very stark contrast here, a 7.5% decrease over the life of Labor's health care agreement to the states per uninsured patient, a 39.2% increase over the life of our health care agreement, the sort of increase per uninsured person never previously seen. The other thing that uh, has come out of uh, comments uh, recently, Mr Speaker, is uh, I have challenged the Labor Party to rule out tinkering with the 30% rebate. I have challenged them to rule out grandfathering it to rule out taking it off ancillaries, to rule out applying it only to the base level premium and a number of other things, and pointedly they have refused to do so. Today in The Australian, the uh, member for Jagger Jagger again comments, and after being challenged by the government to rule these things out, all she would say is Labor will keep the 30 per cent rebate. That's not the point. Keep it in what form? Labor has refused to rule out tinkering it, refused to rule out emasculating it. Labor does not like it, and given half the chance, they will destroy the private health rebate as they did under the Hawke government, as they did under the Whitlam government. <coughs> Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is again to the Minister for Small Business, and I ask if he's seen this leaked report by the Federal Liberal Director Linton Crosby on the state of the Queensland division of the Liberal Party. And have you seen comments in it that, and I quote them, 
The financial problems which the division faces must be addressed immediately. A long-term financial plan must be established which provides a secure financial foundation that eliminates the hand-to-mouth existence that has dogged the division for a decade. End of quote. Yeah. Minister, isn't this the motive for the GST scam which was implemented by your FEC and the by the Queensland Division opposition. of the Liberal Party? A fundraising Deputy scam Leader. to illegally the harvest input Deputy credits the for party activities. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Leader of the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's clearly out of order. It's completely outside the Minister's uh, outside. responsibility. Completely. It is. Absolutely. When the House has come to order, Manager of Opposition Business. To the point of order raised by the Leader of the House, this question is, as, is relevant to the Minister's responsibility as have the previous ones been in exactly the same manner. They go to the question of his accountability to this House and to his motivation in acting in ways that have misled this House. All the questions today have been about— The Manager of Opposition Business has the call. Member for Wannan, member for Sturt. Manager of Opposition Business. All the questions today have referred, as this one has, to the behaviour of the minister as it relates to the Groom FEC GST scam. This relates to it in exactly the same way. Either they are all out of order or they're all in order because it relates in exactly the same way as all the others. The Manager of Opposition Business and the Deputy may have noted that I was, had attempted to interrupt the Deputy Leader of the Opposition while he was asking his question because I do not see how the question framed by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition is involved in an area over which the Minister for Small Business has any jury. I am addressing the House. That the question asked in, uh, involves any area over which the Minister for Small Business has any jurisdiction. I recognise that the Groom FEC is an area over which he has some control. I do not see that the management of the Queensland Liberal Party is. For that reason, I deem the question out of order. I have. I'll hear, I will hear the deputy leader. Mr. Speaker, you've just indicated that, we, that the questions that we have asked the Mem Minister for Small Business, as a Minister for Small Business, involved in a scam that no other small business can get involved in, I relates. Manager, the chair is not being assisted by any of the members on my right. Relates to the his FEC. Deputy Leader of the Opposition has a point of order, and I'm hearing him. Re as I say, Mr. Speaker, that all of those qu questions relate to his knowledge, his involvement in the Groom FEC. This question goes to the motive, and therefore the it is relevant. Deputy Leader I would of the suggest Opposition, to you, Mr. Speaker. Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. I have already, I have already ruled this question out of order. I had no doubt that the member for Groom could be deemed to have some involvement with the Groom FEC. I do not see how the member for Groom, any more than the member for Wakefield, can have any involvement with the management of his state political party. I have ruled the question out of order. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The, by, the Leader of the House will resume his seat. I have not heard the Manager of Opposition Business. The standing orders allow you to rule out part of the question. Thank you very much. And your ruling is based upon the fact that the minister is not responsible for the Queensland Liberal Party but for the Groom FEC. The, the, the last paragraph of the question. The manager of opposition business has the call. The last paragraph of the question. Minister for Community Services. The member for Sturt and the member for Prospect are both warned. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The last section of the question explicitly refers to the activity undertaken by the Groom FEC. I don't agree with your interpretation of the first two paragraphs, but I accept it. You're the speaker. You're entitled to make that ruling. And we are not dissenting from that as it relates to those first two paragraphs. But with regard to this third paragraph, it relates specifically to what you required. That is, it relates to the Groom FEC, and therefore, even if you disallow the first two, you should allow the third paragraph to stand. I have ruled the question out of order. Member for McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Would the Minister update the House on how the Howard government is it is further improving Medicare by using technology to, amongst other things, make it easier for Australians to claim their Medicare rebate. Minister for Health and Aged Care. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member for McPherson for a question. When we came to government, if you wanted to get a Medicare rebate, you had to go to a Medicare office, or if that wasn't available, stick your claim in the post and take your luck. That was it. We took the very strong view that we should extend this, and today there are 600 Medicare Easy Claim facilities operating yeah, yeah, around yeah, Australia, yeah, yeah, yeah. along with 226 Medicare offices. The fact is, people now nearly have four times the options that they had uh, five years ago to claim Medicare. But, Mr. Speaker, there seems to be a more sensible way to do this as well, and as part of the memorandum of understanding with general practice that we signed. Uh, some two years ago, we are exploring claiming Medicare rebates directly from doctors' facilities, or at least lodging the rebates, having the rebates go back to the individual. We're trialling this currently at Inverell in New South Wales, at Kadena in South Australia, and Helensvale in Queensland, and it's being particularly successful. So it has 87 per cent community acceptance, which is very high for a new program such as this, and we're hoping to run this out uh, right round Australia by the end of the year. This will then mean that it is simple for anyone anywhere with a participating doctor to put in a Medicare claim if they wish, a way that was completely unthinkable five years ago. But electronic health uh, has posed a great challenge for governments right around the world. There's no government that has yet perceived to get it right. There are many governments that have got it wrong. Uh, Britain in the late 1980s wasted around a billion dollars on trying to get a health information system together that in the end proved useless. A number of countries I've visited overseas have had very large government reports, but not much happening on the ground. Australia has taken a much more modest approach, and I believe it will prove to be more successful than most other countries. Australia has the added challenge of having state and territory governments, so there are in fact nine jurisdictions on which we have to operate. But the National Health uh, Management Information Management Advisory Council is just about to release its second report on uh, Health Online, which is the blueprint for what uh, Commonwealth states and territories Member are doing. For Jagger, Jagger. The Australian health ministers have recently endorsed uh, the next stage of Health Connect, and this is a two-year process of research and development prior to a decision on a full rollout of a system. By doing it cooperatively with states and territories, we have the uh, prospect of avoiding the rail gauge problem or different states and uh, territories doing different things which is uh, something that has been uh, elusive to us in the past and is an enormous challenge in the future. We have developed uh, public key infrastructure for the Health Insurance Commission, which will allow secure transmission of data, and uh, we have established a Health Electronic Signature Authority, which paves the way for cost-effective and secure transmission of health data over the internet. Member in addition, Jagger, we Jagger. have 70 uh, per cent of GPs now writing prescriptions that are computer generated, and any uh, honourable member who's recently been to the doctor is likely to notice a difference. Four years ago, this didn't exist. The comparable figure for the United States today is about 1 per cent of prescriptions being computer generated. We generate 70 per cent. And the better, management, better medication management system is looking at creating a secure and comprehensive uh, pharmaceutical health record. This is something uh, that has been elusive in the past. It offers enormous benefits to the community in terms of safety, quality and being able to track different medications provided by different doctors and different pharmacies. It is a completely voluntary system. People choose to opt in if they see benefit to it. We expect most of the population to do so. Member for Corwell. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Honourable the Treasurer. 
In the light of the fact that certain studies have shown that there has been an unfair impact of the GST on certain poorer sections of the Australian community, will the Honourable Treasurer announce an immediate review of these negative impacts the member and, for Blair and also and announce before the election measures to compensate poor people by more significant reductions in income taxes and more assistance to pensioners and those on fixed incomes. I invite the Treasurer to respond to the question. He's aware, of course, that he cannot announce policy. Uh, well, well, I, well, I, uh, I have uh, no intention, uh, Mr Speaker, of uh, announcing uh, policy, uh, and uh, I, uh, I welcome the, uh, the searching question from uh, the member for Corwell. My former tutor uh, taught me second-year politics at uh, Monash University. And, uh, I, I, I owe him everything I know, Mr Speaker. Uh, I think he considers me to be one of his Treasure greatest creations. Uh, uh, he gave me a uh, <laughs> he gave me a lifetime distrust of left-wing politics in that uh, second-year tutorial, and uh, the uh, the course, Mr. Speaker, was actually called the morality of power, something that he's exercised ever since. And uh, can I say? Uh, but my old tutor, um, much as I have a soft spot for him and much as uh, the intellectual in inspiration which he gave me beats within my heart, uh, I don't always agree with him, Mr Speaker. Treasurer. And I don't agree uh, with Treasurer. him on this occasion. Treasurer. Treasurer. Member for Lowe on a, po a point of order. Member for Lowe on a point of order. A point of order, and it goes to the question of relevance. We've had half a the member for Lowe resume his seat. Quest. The member for Lowe will resume his seat. The Parliament. The member for Graindler. The Parliament had just witnessed 30 seconds of good natured banter which did not justify the intervention by the member for Lowe. The Treasurer. But uh, I was coming to say, Mr Speaker, much as I admire him, I do not always agree with him. And uh, I do not agree with the uh, proposition that he put that. Recent studies have uh, shown uh, that uh, poorer sections of the community are worse off because of tax reform. I do not believe recent studies have uh, wow. shown that. In fact, quite the, opposite. Uh, quite the opposite, as the Prime Minister said. There was a recent study uh, that I saw reported in the Fairfax newspapers on the weekend by the uh, NatSim Group, right. which showed that uh, as a consequence of uh, the government's tax reforms, single-income families had improved their position quite considerably. Uh, in fact, a, uh, well, somebody throws off at Bettina Rant uh, from yeah. the uh, yeah, Labor well, Party uh, yeah. side of the, uh, of the House, Treasurer. but uh, yeah. Mr Speaker, uh, Bettina Rant, uh, in my view, is entitled to write up the NatSem results, and as I said uh, earlier, the NatSem is certainly uh, not some uh, organisation which is beholden to the government in any way. No. In fact, uh, as I recall, the Labor Party relied very considerably on, uh, on NatSem, and as as I also recall, NatSem did the analysis, most probably even drew the Labor Party's tax policy at the last federal election. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, so uh, we're all entitled to have a look at what NatSem did. And in this uh, regard, the NatSem survey, which was yes written up by uh, Bettina Arndt and uh, was in the Fairfax papers on the weekend, found that single-income families had very considerably improved their position under the government's tax changes. A single-income family with one addiction. child under five years and, uh, and a second child above that earning $35,000 receives additional benefits of $87 a week. $87 a week as a result of tax cuts and increases in family assistance. And as that uh, material also found, a single-income family that was uh, on, uh, on a government income support was a big winner. A single-income family with a child under five earning $29,000 receives an additional $59 a week. The truth of the matter is this, that if the Labor Party had defeated 
our tax proposal, single income families today would be much worse off. And all Australians would be paying higher income taxes, and all companies would be paying higher company taxes, and all Australians would also be paying financial institutions duty and a whole raft of other questions. Now, I'm also asked about uh, pensions. The truth of the matter is that the government increased the pension by 4%. <laughs> and maintains it in real terms 2 per cent above the CPI. That is 2 per cent higher, further in front of prices than it would otherwise have been. And that was in addition to the other commitment which this government legislated, was that the uh, age pension be legislated to 25 per cent of male total average weekly earnings. And that was something which had never been put in legislation before this government came to office. So, in relation to pensions, there was also the savings bonus of up to $1,000, dollar for dollar for pensioners. There was the additional $2,000 for the self-funded retiree. There was the announcement in the most recent budget of $300 for aged pensioners or part pensioners. The announcements in relation to Member prisoners of war. There was the increase in the Commonwealth Seniors Health Care Card. There was the reduction in taxes, which are paid by older Australians over 65 years of age. There have been the $2.4 billion increase in family tax assistance, either through the tax system or the payment system, the reductions in income taxes, Mr. Speaker, and the reduction of a whole host of other uh, taxes. So, uh, in answer to the honourable member's question, the I Treasurer, do not uh, believe Treasurer, that there is such a finding, and the government uh, has made full and adequate compensation. Has the Treasurer concluded his answer? The Treasurer has concluded his answer. Honourable Member for Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When the House has come to order, the Honourable Member for Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is directed to the Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Small Business. Is right, the Minister yes. aware of the outcome of the main train dispute? How has this dispute affected Australian working families? Minister, what is the government's response, and are there any alternative policies in this area? Good question. Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Small Business. Uh, Mr Speaker, I uh, thank uh, the member for Hughes for her question and for her commitment to ensuring that power is exercised responsibly uh, in the Australian community. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, this, uh, this dispute uh, at Main Train is now over. Uh, I'm delighted that the dispute is over, and it's over without any acceptance uh, of the Manusafe scheme, a scheme which is not about protecting existing entitlements, which is about creating new entitlements, a scheme which, if fully implemented, would cost some 160,000 jobs in manufacturing industry alone, and a scheme which is, of course, fully encompassed uh, uh, by the Member policy of the Australian Labor Party. But, Mr. Speaker, Let's be very clear uh, about the actions of the Australian uh, Manufacturing Workers Union in this dispute, a union which last year gave the Labor Party $680,000, which is currently running a half a million dollar marginal seat campaign to support the Leader of the Opposition and which controls the second largest block vote inside the Labor Party. First, Mr Speaker, this union strategically targeted a company in the hope uh, that rail chaos uh, uh, would disrupt the lives of hundreds of thousands of New South Wales commuters. Second, Mr Speaker, this union needlessly prolonged a dispute for seven weeks and cost 220 of its members some $5,000 in pay to achieve a result that could have been had on day one. Now, Mr Speaker, any union which is involved in an attempt to hold the general community to ransom uh, and which costs its own members Member for thousands Brisbane. and thousands of dollars in a futile dispute. Any union action uh, along those lines deserves to be condemned. Now, Mr. Speaker, let me quote. Let me quote uh, uh, from a member opposite uh, in responsible mode. This was the uh, uh, member for Brisbane, the shadow minister for industrial relations uh, last year, who says it is unacceptable that one side in a dispute which judges it has the muscle or resources to starve out those it should be negotiating with 
uh, can simply force an outcome irrespective of the merits of their case. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's Labor's theory, uh, but it's not Labor's practice. There was not one word of complaint, let alone condemnation, of this dispute from any member opposite. Uh, the New South Wales uh, completely backed the strike, completely backed the union, uh, even though uh, these workers' jobs were in fact uh, protected by a contract with the New South Wales government. And Mr Speaker, last night we even had in this House the member for Graindler actually congratulating Dougie Cameron, actually congratulating Dougie Cameron uh, for, for, he said, providing leadership in this area. Well, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the really reprehensible thing, the really reprehensible thing, is that for months now uh, the Australian Labor Party has been trying to scare Australian workers uh, that their entitlements are at risk, even though, Mr. Speaker, fewer than one tenth of one percent of Australian workers will find themselves in a situation uh, of losing a job uh, because of the bankruptcy of their employer. Members opposite have been trying to scare workers at good, solid, decent companies, such as Orange Te Telecommunications, which is backed by the giant Hutchison Wampoa Group, and such as Main Train itself, which is part of the Ganinans Group, which has been in operation for more than a century, which had record, prof record profits last year, which has a $1 billion order book, and whose contracts, whose chief contracts are with the New South Wales government itself. Well, Mr Speaker, it is absolutely disgraceful that members opposite are not interested in workers when they're workers. They're only interested in workers when they're victims. And if they really cared about the workers of Australia, they wouldn't be scaring them about their jobs. Uh, they wouldn't be scaring them about their futures. They'd be supporting the government's safety net entitlement scheme. But, Mr Speaker, what the Australian people are coming to know is that Labor means strikes, and strikes cost jobs. Mr. Speaker. I inform the House that I have recognised in the gallery Mr Ted Grace, a former government whip, I believe for a time former opposition whip and former member for Fowler. On behalf of all of his former colleagues and the members of the House, extend to him a welcome. The Leader of the Opposition. And my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, I refer to the fact that you have a representative who sits on your behalf on the executive of the Queensland Division of the Liberal Party, Senator Ian Macdonald and Minister Brough as proxy. Do you recall yesterday Minister McFarlane claiming that the instructions to arrange the groomed GST scam came from the Queensland Division Head Office? Do you also recall your Federal Director admitting yesterday that the GST scam had spread to the electorates of Lilly and Leichhardt? Prime Minister, what action did your representatives take to shut down the GST scam? Prime Minister. Speaker, I, uh, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question. Um, I don't accept the description of what occurred as a scam. That's my first statement. Mr. Prime Speaker, Minister, I, I would the remind. Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, I would remind. Um, I would remind Minister the leader for Veterans Affairs. The Prime Minister has the call. I'd remind the leader of the opposition. The member for Denison. The member for Bruce. Prime Minister. Remind the uh, Leader of the Opposition that um, he referred to a statement that was released uh, by Mr Crosby, uh, who, might I say, Mr Speaker, throughout the entirety of this as the senior executive officer of the Liberal Party of Australia, has acted with total dispatch and complete transparency, Mr Speaker. And I, and I, uh, I, uh, I, want to, I want to, I want to put that, uh, I want to put that point on record, Mr. Speaker. The, the detailed uh, report that Member he, that he released uh, yesterday, um, so far from indicating that the uh, alleged scam, which I don't accept, had spread, indicated that uh, in a total of some hundreds of transactions, a very small number had been found to be in error. The total amount of the shortfall of tax was about $180. $180, Mr. Speaker, and that $180, Mr. Minister Speaker. Minister for Forest and in Conservation. The case, in the case of the groom, in the case of the groom Federal Electorate Council, we have had we have had the affairs of this Parliament at question time tied up now for three days over a mistaken shortfall of $76, Mr. Speaker. That is 
That is the measure. Member that for is Charlton. the measure, Mr. Speaker, of what has been involved in. Look, on a scale of one to ten, Mr. Speaker, any, Member any for alleged Oxley. misrepresent. Any alleged misrepresentation, Mr Speaker, you talk about scam, the misrepresentation by the Leader of the Opposition about health in Western Australia was the scam, the scam of the last month, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. A point of order. Yes. Has the, the Minister for Forests and Conservation is warned. I am about to ask the Prime Minister whether or not he has concluded his answer. The Prime Minister. We might the, get an answer. The, the point of order. The was leader of the The rules, as long as I've occupied the chair, are very simple. I rarely, if ever, deny anyone the call. They simply wait to receive the call. The leader of the opposition. Relevance that I rise, uh, Mr. Speaker. What did the Prime Minister's representatives do to shut the scam down? The leader of the opposition. The Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have we have we have a mistaken shortfall in the case of the Groom FEC uh, of seventy-six dollars. That that pales into insignificance to the four million a year you get out of Centenary House. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, if you really, if you really want, if you really want a political scar. I am not being assisted by members on my right. <laughs> Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Does the Leader of the Opposition have a point of order? Mr. Speaker, and it goes the to this is a million miles from the answer to the question of what the is representative to shut down. Seat. It's true that the Prime Minister made tangential reference to items that were not directly related to the question. That's not unusual in question time. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I repeat the, I do not accept that what occurred was a scam. Mr Speaker, it has been explained in, in some detail by the Minister for Small Business, Mr Speaker. Member for Blacksland. Uh, it, has been, it has been augmented, Mr Speaker by the statements made on behalf of the Federal Secretariat of the Liberal Party, both by, by Mr Linton Crosby and by Mr Colin Gracie, Mr Speaker. Uh, we've, we've heard from the Deputy Leader of the Opposition a series of questions which illustrate only one thing, his ignorance of the operation of the new taxation system, Mr Speaker. A series of questions that have been asked, Mr Speaker, and I'd also, I'd also remind the, the Leader of the Opposition not only of the contents of the statement that have been made by the Minister for Small Business, the statements that have been made by Lyndon Crosley, Mr Speaker, but I'd also, remind Shorten. Him, I'd also remind the Leader of the Opposition that on Sunday I announced after consultation with Senator Heron, the President of the Queensland Division of the Liberal Party, that there would be a full audit by the Tax Office into the into the GST, into the GST compliance, Mr. Speaker, by the Queensland Division. Now, Mr. Speaker, I take this opportunity of, of confirming, of confirming an understanding I had from a response by the leader of the opposition yesterday that strangely didn't appear in Hansard. That is the leader of the opposition's response. I take it that the leader of the opposition is happy to have an order to the Victorian branch of the Labor Party. He said that yesterday. I have had made a note of that. Have, you, have you written to the tax office authorising it yet? Prime Minister. Hey? Prime Minister. Ah, ah, Prime ah, Minister. Ah, we haven't done that. Well, no doubt, no doubt you'll get around it, or, or, or maybe the caucus briefer will do it on your behalf, Mr. Prime Minister. The Leader of the Opposition is running the risk of not being recognised. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat.
Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh, I thought he had a point of order. The, the Leader of the Opposition, on a point Mr. of order. On a point of order, relevance. Five minutes into the answer now. What action did his representatives right. take to shut down the, the Leader GST of the Opposition scam? resume his seat? The Prime Minister. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the short answer to the, to the Leader of the Opposition's question, of course, was contained in the first answer that I gave. I did not accept the description of a scam, Mr. Speaker. So if a scam doesn't exist, uh, Mr. Speaker, there's, there's nothing to close down, Mr. Speaker. But I did, I did take the opportunity, uh, the opportunity of outlining, Mr. Speaker, the, the transparent way in, in which the Liberal Party organisation has dealt with this matter, Mr. Speaker. I remind the House again that the, the shortfall as a result. Of the, uh, uh, of the events that have been canvassed in Member the Minister's statement. Mr Speaker, the shortfall in the case of the Groom FEC was $76, Member for Mr Ports. Speaker, and that amount has been accounted for in a subsequent business activity statement. The shortfall in the entirety of the Queensland Division, according to the statement released by Lyndon Crosby, the Federal Director of the party yesterday, is the grand sum of $180, Mr Speaker. It's $180 which represents the totality of this alleged scam. It's $180 which has occupied the time of the man who would be Treasurer of this country, Mr the Speaker. For Melbourne. And in the process, we have had demonstrated to us a, a, a pathetic mm. misunderstanding of the operation of the taxation laws. But on top of that, Mr Speaker, in, in the interest the member of, for Oxley uh, is of, born. of not only the the reality of transparency, but also the, the appearance of, the of transparency, Mr. Speaker. We have said that we will have a total audit of the affairs of the Queensland Division of the Party so far as they relate to the operation the Chief of the Opposition goods and services. Is warned. The goods and services tax legislation, Mr. Speaker. I think that is complete openness. I think that is complete transparency, Mr. Speaker, and I think the preoccupation, particularly of the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, with this issue, Mr. Speaker, over the past few days, is indicative of the policy bankruptcy of an opposition only a matter of several months out from an important general election. When the House has come to order, The Honourable Member for Petrie. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Small Business. Would the Minister inform the House of recent employment data from Queensland? And why is un the unemployment rate in Queensland worse than any other mainland states? How have Queensland industrial relations changes hurt employment and small business in my state? And what is the Howard government doing to solve the unemployment problem in Queensland? The Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Small Business. Uh, Minister. Mr Speaker, I thank the member for Petrie for a question and I thank her for her strong support for the workers and job seekers uh, in her electorate and surrounding areas. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, uh, I can tell the House that since March 1996, member, Unemployment in Queensland has dropped Batman. from 8.7 uh, to 8.1 per cent. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, in March 1996, uh, unemployment in Queensland was about the national average. Uh, I'm afraid to say that now uh, Queensland has the highest unemployment oh. of any mainland state uh, because of the industrial relations rollback practised by the BD oh. government. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, the BD government's uh, Workplace relations legislation allows strike pay. Uh, it virtually abolished Queensland workplace agreements. It stopped award simplification. Uh, it abolished the Queensland Employment Advocate. Uh, it removed uh, uh, small, the exemption uh, from the unfair dismissal provisions uh, for small business. And, Mr. Speaker, it allows the Queensland Industrial Commission uh, to declare contractors uh, to be employees. But, Mr. Speaker, what would you expect? 
What would you expect from a government completely under the thumb of the Australian Workers' Union, oh, yeah. uh, which last year gave the Labor Party no less than $653,000? A classic case of cash for policy. Well, Mr. Speaker, well, Mr. Speaker, this is just a foretaste of the kind of industrial relations rollback uh, that Australia would experience if the Leader of the Opposition were ever to form a government. And, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition would actually go further, would actually go further uh, than Premier Beattie. He would force Australia's one million small businesses to enter compulsory union bargaining, which would mean that every time there's a knock on the door of small business, it could be the union heavies uh, demanding their uh, right of entry and chorusing, have we got a good faith bargain for you, Mr Speaker? Well, Mr Speaker, the Queensland experience proves, it proves that rollback costs jobs. But, Mr Speaker, while the Queensland government is punishing small business, uh, the federal government, the Howard government, is getting on with providing job seekers in Queensland with the world's best employment Member services, Blair. Mr Speaker. In the electorate of Dixon, uh, for instance, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, this government uh, has put in place uh, some 44 work for the Dole projects uh, over the last three years, uh, which has provided valuable work experience to nearly 2,000 young Queenslanders. When members opposite were in power, there were just two CES officers in the electorate of Dixon. Uh, now uh, uh, job network sites are in double figures. But, Mr Speaker, what would the member for Dixon know? What would the member for Dixon know? Because she is the ultimate absentee political landlord, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, from the deck of the Gold Coast High Rise, uh, uh, where she lives, Mr. Oh, it's not true, is it? The, oh, she says it's not true. The minister, uh, from the deck, the minister from the deck will not the, respond to interjections. Oh, sorry, Mr. The minister Speaker, will from the deck of the, the Gold Coast High, re, high Rise. Oh, oh, minister, me, member for Dixon, member for Dixon. Member for Dixon, the member for Dixon is defying the chair. Manager of Opposition Business. My point of order is obviously relevance. The residents, even though the information is inaccurate, whether it's accurate or not, the, the residence of the member for Dixon is not relevant of, to any matter the raised in the question nor any ministerial. The member for Dixon is doing nothing to enhance her case by defying the chair. The minister's response to this question is doing nothing to elevate the dignity of the chamber. I ask him to confine his remarks to the minister. I'm, I'm simply pointing out Neither that, Mr. Speaker, is the action of the member for the, from the Melbourne Ports, of a high rise as he on must the be Gold well aware. Coast, uh, you can just about see Dixon right. on a good day. You can just minister, about see Dixon on a good day. Minister. Manager of Opposition Hello, Business. Guys. It is quite clear that the Minister is defying your very Manager of Opposition ruling. Business will resume his seat. As any impartial observer will have been aware, I was in fact fairly or unfairly dealing with the Melbourne for Melbourne ports when the Minister made that statement. I did not hear what he said. I will listen to his remarks. I ask him to come back to the question. Mr Speaker, uh, I've been asked about what the Howard government is doing uh, to help uh, uh, boost employment in Queensland, and we're doing a lot more uh, than the member for Dixon, who doesn't live in her electorate, never lived in her electorate. Last year she even said uh, that she was about to live in the Gold Coast, Mr Speaker. Minister. The minister will come back to the question without reference to the member for Dixon or resume his seat.
Let me, let me simply conclude, Mr Speaker, that unlike the Queensland Labor government, we are interested uh, in producing more jobs for Queenslanders, Mr Speaker, and the last thing that Queenslanders need is industrial relations role. Here, here. De Deputy Leader of the Opposition, resume his seat. The, the Leader of the House is waiting as the Leader of the Opposition was waiting for the call. The Leader of the House. Well, Mr Speaker, just on a point of clarification, uh, it does seem an odd ruling that a member should not be able to refer to a member on the other side and Leader ask the you House whether or not that's seat. your intention. For the information of all members, and I'm sure it's self-evident to all, there is no intention to restrict the opportunity for members to say anything within this within the standing orders. However, it was patently obvious that what the minister was saying was doing nothing to enhance the dignity of the House. For that reason, I obliged him to resume his seat. Manager. Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Member for Werriwa. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I ask him, have you seen a report in today's Courier Mail that one of the three Queensland Liberal fundraisers at which the GST scam was used took place in the North Queensland seat of Leichhardt. Prime Minister, was this the Cairns fundraising dinner that you hosted in late March? And if so, why was the GST scam still operating a month after you claim it had been shut down? Prime Minister, first part of the question is no, I haven't seen that report in the Courier Mail. To be perfectly honest, I have been occupied on other things this morning yeah, that, have, uh, that, have, that have prevented me from reading in detail all the newspaper reports uh, about this particular matter. Uh, I've attended numerous fundraisers in Queensland, and I've got to say um, I'm, I'm always proud to go to a fundraiser in the seat of Leichhardt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because if ever, a, if ever a person identifies with his electorate and lives amongst and works for his people, yeah. Yeah. So I am, I am absolutely proud this as I am indeed to go to fundraisers for any of my magnificent colleagues. Uh, uh, but but as, to, uh, as, to the details, as to the details of individual fundraisers, I, I don't know what those are raised for any more than I suspect you are. This was a scam. Mr Speaker, I don't, think, I don't think the word scam does anything to enhance the dignity of the House. <laughs> The member for Brisbane is right, but it is in fact the chair that is feeling sensitive. The member for Herbert will resume his seat. Member for Herbert. Mr Speaker, my question uh, is addressed to the Minister for Education, Training and Youth Affairs. The member for Braddon is warned. Minister, uh, would you advise the House of projected increases in university places? And are you aware of any alternative policies dealing with this issue? And what's your response to them? <coughs> Minister for Education, Training and Youth Affairs. Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for Herbert for his question and I acknowledge the great interest that he has in the 
expansion of opportunities for young people uh, in the electorate of Herbert to attend university. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, the government has taken the view that it is very important for the future of Australia that there be growing opportunities for young Australians to lift their level of knowledge and skills. And this has been a quite dramatic contrast with the attitude that was taken when he was minister by the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, because we remember his view, Mr Speaker, that at that time the Australian universities were big enough. There were enough places in Australian universities. As he told The Age in February 1992, the desperation to get into higher education is really misplaced. Uh, indeed, uh, the Australian reported in February of that year, Mr. Speaker, that, and I quote, Mr. Beasley said that Australia had unquestionably reached a point where people's expectations about entering university had to change. You cannot provide universal higher education, he said. And uh, in November of that year, he, uh, he further emphasised his view that there was no need for further places in Australian universities. He said, we're approaching the limit of our capacity to continue to expand publicly funded university places. Now, this is a view that has never been accepted by this government, Mr Speaker. Our view has been that young Australians with proper qualifications are entitled to attend university and to get university training. And since 1996, the total number of student places has increased to this year by 28,000 places. On Friday, I announced the universities where 2,670 extra students will begin their studies next year, with the allocation of an additional 2,000 new places each year in maths, science and information technology, vital for Australia's innovation, and a further 670 places each year at campuses in booming regional areas. Uh, these additional new places each year, Mr Speaker, will produce some 20,800 additional places in Australia's universities over the next four years. Regional Australia received more than half the places, enabling almost 1,485 additional places uh, will be made available next year at regional campuses. Mr Speaker, the member for Herbert, I'm sure, will be particularly pleased that James Cook University received an additional 100 places for integrated bachelor programs in information technology and e-business and a further 25 places for other courses. Australian universities are now projecting that total university places will reach some 599,000 equivalent full-time places by 2003 a 30.5 per cent increase on enrolments since 1995. Mr Speaker, the fundamental difference has been that we have not been prepared to take the view of the Leader of the Opposition that Australian universities were large enough, that there was no further need for additional university places. Our view is that Australia's comparative advantage in the world depends on having a highly skilled and highly qualified workforce. Uh, Mr Speaker, like some latter-day Atlantis, the noodle nation has sunk beneath the waves, has sunk beneath the waves, and un, un, <laughs> it's vanished. It's vanished. Well, say something about it. The, the leader minister of the will address says, his remarks you wish the chair. Not a single, not a single reference has been made to noodle nation by the leader of the opposition uh, or knowledge nation. Since, since he launched it, Mr. Speaker, it's just vanished. It's in this house. In this house, he it has vanished, disappeared beneath the waves, evanesced entirely, Mr. Speaker. Even though he committed himself that he spent every working day, every working day trying to implement it, and we haven't seen a working minute in question time in this house devoted to it, Mr. Speaker. The problem with the leader of the opposition is that he has no consistency. He has no reliability. He will say anything in his efforts to win office. The trouble for him this time is round is that the Australian people know him too well. Leader of the Opposition. Um, my question, yeah, that's it.
Please. My question is to the Minister for Small Business. Oh. Minister, are you aware that the Ryan FEC was approached by the Queensland Division of the Liberal Party to implement the same GST scam it had implemented in your FEC of Groom? Are you aware that the Ryan FEC pointedly refused to implement the scam on the basis that it was potentially illegal? Minister, given that the rank and file members in Ryan had the courage to stand up to your state office, why Le didn't you, the, the senior Queensland Liberal the MP, also have the courage and decency? The Leader of the Opposition, I noted the questions the Leader of the Opposition was asking. It. I cannot see how the business of the Ryan FEC is the, minister, is the business of the Minister for. It, when I have concluded my statement, I could not see how the Minister for Small Business, as a member of the Groom FEC, had any control over the activities of the Ryan FEC. The Leader of the Opposition. To, to that point of order, Mr Speaker, or the question that you have effectively asked me, the point is this, Mr Speaker. Uh, the, in the answers that he has been giving to questions over the last couple of days, he has been claiming he has been in the hands. Of, uh, and, his, uh, and his electorate council has been in the hands of the Queensland State Branch of the Liberal Party. And that has prohibited him from upholding the standards that are required of him as a minister. And what I'm pointing out here is the fact that the, another of those electoral divisions had precisely the same instructions, behaved the precisely correctly. Leader of the opposition, and why the leader of the opposition will resume his seat. Leader of the House on a point of order. Well, I put it to you, Mr. Speaker. It is as uh, plain as the nose on your face that this is well outside the ministerial responsibilities. Uh, it's, uh, I invite you, Mr. Speaker, to give exactly the same ruling as you did earlier. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the question is obviously out of order and should be ruled accordingly. Well, if we, I have, may, we have members on this side who uh, have the questions House. to ask, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the House, my mother may not be impressed with your analogy, but uh, that aside. I do believe that my ruling is entirely consistent with the ruling I gave earlier. The, the Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. May's a ruling as yet, Mr Speaker. I thought you were about to make one. Mr. I, Mr. Speaker, I will hear the Leader the, of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, the last paragraph which I was reading, I believe, would make it completely clear to you and to the House that this was within the responsibilities that have been assumed for the last three or four days in this place by the uh, member concerned. And that leader paragraph the, says this. The Leader of the Opposition. You may not have heard it because of the hubbub when I was trying to read it. Oh, well, Minister, the given the rank and file members in Ryan had the courage to stand up to your state office, I am hearing the leader of the why didn't last you, paragraph? as senior Queensland Liberal MP, also have the courage and decency to shut down the Groom GST scam? 100 per cent on the what his responsibilities are. Seat. Leader of the um, I thought the Leader of the House was seeking the call. Well, I was, because uh, what was being put to you was uh, debating material after you had made a ruling. And, Mr Speaker, we I only now invite Leader you to the House uh, follow through seat. on the ruling. Consistent, consistent with the ruling I gave earlier, I did not see how the member for Groom could have any authority or control over the activities of either Liberal Party branches, the FEC, or members of the Ryan electorate, and for that reason I have ruled the question out of order. The, <coughs> just before the, I, before I recognise the Leader of the Opposition, I am not denying him the opportunity clearly to move dissent. Does the member for Macon have a point of order? Then I have a question. Mr. Member Macon will resume his seat. <laughs> the Leader of the Opposition. <coughs> the you won't be waiting long, Member for Prospect, unless you remember your status in the House currently. The Leader of the House. The point of order, Mr. Speaker, is you've ruled the question out of order. You have not recognised the Leader of the Opposition, and under the Convention, you should look to your right, and a member is on her feet seeking the call to ask a question. The Leader of the House. I, the Leader of the House, I did in fact. The Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Leader of the House, I ruled the question out of order.
The Leader of the Opposition then rose and said, I move dissent from your ruling. Um, that they were the sequence of events. For that reason, I had recognised the Leader of the Opposition and had only interrupted him because of the reasonable presumption that the member for Macon, who was on her feet, may have had a point of order. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I do this with very great reluctance, Mr Speaker, to move this. And in order to fully comprehend this uh, debate on a dissent from your ruling, let me read you the question that you have. I have. I have. Well, thank you very much. I think you need to talk to when Dr the House come about to order, politics again. The Treasurer, the dissent has been moved. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. The question was this. Minister, are you aware that the Ryan FEC was approached by the Queensland Division of the Liberal Party to implement the same GST scam it had implemented in your FEC of Groom? Are you aware that the Ryan FEC pointedly refused to implement the scam on the basis that it was potentially illegal? Now, for the last three days in Parliament, Mr uh, Speaker, Questions have been asked to the Minister for Small Business on precisely the affairs of his FEC, which are relevant in this chamber, not simply because they are the affairs of his FEC, but because, as Minister for Small Business, he has a particular charter from this government to understand the complaints and concerns that small business have of the operation of the goods and services tax. Indeed, you will recollect, Mr Speaker, that a, that a memo has been leaked and uh, dealt with previously in this parliament, in which he, at some length, addressed the cabinet on the subject of the difficulties that small business were experiencing with the goods and services tax. He brought that submission before the cabinet, and uh, it included within it uh, the possibility that suggestions would ultimately be made to cabinet about the actual operation of the tax system itself, because the government had asked him to do so. He is not the only minister. The Treasurer is not the only minister in this place Leader of the who has responsibility. His seat, the Leader of the House. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition has a, a very tight remit. He has to take the words of the question and then specify how those words fall within the ministerial responsibility. Uh, the, the, no, you're not. No, no. What, the, you, what you are talking about are, are the matters regimes. within the responsibility of the minister. What you've got to do is show how the question, Mr. Speaker, I put it to you. He's got to show how the question fits within the responsibility of the minister. We don't need a lecture on the minister's whatever responsibilities the, may, the minister may have. We need a specific statement, and the, the standing orders require that he sticks to that in this motion. Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the Opposition has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. To that point of order, that is precisely what I'm doing. If, if you had I'm not been doing it, I would have intervened. Thank the you. Leader of the Opposition thank has you, the Mr. call. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So let me continue as I was in establishing the responsibility of the Minister for Small Business for the GST system. He is, of course, not the principal minister responsible for it, who is the Treasurer. And there are assistant treasurers, but other ministers have been given explicit responsibilities, and it includes him. Includes him. He has the responsibility for listening to small business on this, according to his own cabinet submission, and bringing those matters before the cabinet, and making suggestions to the cabinet on how relief might be offered to small business. And that includes, Mr. Speaker, that includes the operation of the business activity statement. Oh, Leader of the House. Speaker, my point of order is based on the. I don't have the full draft of the question, which I'd appreciate if there's a spare, but the opening words were Are you aware that the Ryan FEC was approached, etc.? In other words, it was a question that went to the internal affairs of the Ryan Federal Electric Committee. Now, Mr Speaker, what the uh, Leader of the Opposition has got to, got to do is to show how the question fits within the ministerial responsibilities. And, uh, he, has, he, has not even, he has not even approached the subject matter, Mr Speaker. Uh, the fact is he, he doesn't. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I would, of course, put to you the reason he hasn't. But the fact is his obligation 
is to refer to he's got to refer to the organization of the Liberal Party in an adjoining electorate or other electorate and demonstrate how the affairs of an FEC outside of the minister's uh, uh, portfolio responsibilities are somehow related to them. And, Mr. Speaker, he has not even started the Leader of the House to approach made that his point issue. Of order. He is therefore clearly out of the order. Of the House completely. Made his point of order. The Leader of the Opposition, it struck me, was mounting an argument, whether I like it or not, that seemed consistent with the dissent. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I go on to say, and, and thank you for, uh, for that, uh, dealing with the, the question in that way, uh, the responsibilities of the Minister for Small Business are amply seen in that leaked Cabinet document. You have sent the Minister for Small Business, the Government has sent the Minister for Small Business around the country devising recommendations for the Government on how the implementation of that tax system might be made easier for them. And there are many people in small business, uh, Mr Speaker, and particularly many in charitable small businesses, who would be very grateful if the so sort of operation conducted by the Groom FEC was an operation available to them, which is precisely why we've been asking the question of the on it within his seat. ministerial I name the me the member for Prospect will excuse herself from the House under the provisions of 304A. The Leader of the House. Speaker, my point of order is um, uh, that the um, question of tax reform generally, uh, or the question of tax reform and its impact on small business. Uh, is unrelated to the matter before the chair, which is that your ruling uh, of, uh, to, uh, in respect of the question uh, is to be dissented from. To establish that proposition, Mr Speaker, uh, the Leader of the Opposition has to advance argument uh, to the proposition, namely, that the question was within the confines of the standing orders that could be asked. And Mr Speaker, you knocked it out. And unless he starts putting forward that proposition, which he has not even as yet done so, uh, he, the is, House, he is clearly the out House of order. His seat. I'll listen to the Leader of the Opposition. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I do believe it is necessary in moving dissent from your ruling, and clearly the way in which you have ruled, and I appreciate it, enables me to do this, that uh, <coughs> to establish a level of ministerial responsibility for the goods and services tax, so we can move from that to establish the reason why he has been subject to the questioning he has been about the affairs of his FEC and why a compare and contrast with the affairs of another FEC, of another FEC, a question Leader about the House, that and a compare and contrast done with his FEC amounts to a question within the standing orders and therefore a justification for a dissent, ruling, a dissent motion from a ruling which ruled the question out of order. So I have been, in the remarks I have made to this point, establishing with ample clarity the fact that the government regards the Minister for Small Business as a person who reports to them on suggestions which might be made to changes in the way in which the goods and services tax operates, and therefore the organisation of a scheme within his Federal Electorate Council and the operations of a scheme elsewhere are directly relevant to the concerns that he has as Minister for Small Business. So, as I said, the opening part of the uh, question that I asked, the opening paragraph, established the relationship between the Ryan FEC and the scam which has been the subject of continual questioning over the course of the last three parliamentary sitting days. And the paragraph went on from the first part of the paragraph that the minister in intervening referred to. Minister, are you aware that the Ryan FEC was approached by the Queensland Division of the Liberal Party to implement the same GST scam 
It had been implemented, that had been implemented in your FEC of Groom. That is the scam that we have been questioning the minister on for the last few days. And then it goes on, are you also aware that the Ryan FEC pointedly refused to implement the scam on the basis that it was potentially illegal? Now, why is that relevant? Well, that is relevant, Mr Speaker, because questions asked of this minister have been answered by the minister to defend himself by saying, look, even though I have responsibility as a minister, even though I am a member of the government, the Ryan FEC, as can be seen from my conversations with the Vice President of the Central Executive and others about this matter, has been operating on the directions of the Executive by implication, therefore without the capacity on its own initiative to deal with the problem. That was part of an 11-minute or 15-minute no, defence in question time yesterday and two answers on a censure motion. Part of his defence—he doesn't disclaim responsibility for the GST as part of his defence—but part of his defence rests on the assumption that uh, he is powerless or if it is irrelevant to him that he Leader is— of the House. That's precisely what I'm doing. The leader of the opposition has the call. That is precisely what I'm doing. And that uh, the state executive takes these matters out of his hands. We think it's an inadequate defence. We think it's a pathetic defence. We think it's an outrageous defence, and so does the rest of the public. But the point of the matter is, it is his defence. It is his defence. And therefore, this alleged powerlessness on his part when contrasted with what was determined by the Ryan FEC, demonstrates quite completely, which is why we ask the question, that he had an ambit, an area of discretion to revolt against himself personally the illegal directions of the Queensland Central oh, Executive. Man. This is just a bit of time. This is just time. I would remind all members of the House that points of order, while a matter of irritation to the chair, no matter which side they come from, it strikes me there's a very un anything but an even-handed approach taken to the reception of points of order, depending on which side rises. The leader of the House. To, um, speak at the um the, the member for Burke is well aware of the strategy, having exercised it himself on a number of occasions. The Leader of the House. Now, the Leader of the Opposition is developing an argument which is that the uh, Minister had certain courses of action available to him. Mr Speaker, regardless of whether he had courses of action available to him, the issue before you is a dissent motion. And the only matters that can be put before you are whether or not the words contained in the question, which form the substance of your ruling, uh, were appropriate questions. Uh, under the standing orders, uh, as usual, and as has been the from the of very business. opening remarks from the leader of the opposition, he has failed to demonstrate in any way or be relevant to the basic question the leader uh, of the on House a dissent made his motion. Point of order. He should therefore, in this regard, in the submission he's putting to you now, be ruled out of order, the and he should be asked to come back. Not that he's been to it. The, the point leader of the at House hand. Resume his seat. I warn the member for Burke. Matters of dissent from the chair's ruling are clearly always difficult for the chair. And for that reason, some latitude had been extended. Leader of the Opposition. Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition, the manager of the Leader of the House would be well aware that whether my ruling was correct or in order, the latitude extended to one side of the House has always been extended to the other. Consistently, the Leader of the Opposition. You're going to start on my daughter. Is that what you're going to start on? You're going to start on my daughter. That's the relevant. The leader of what the, are we dealing with? I will with deal here? with the Leader of the House if I need to, and I will deal with the Leader of the Opposition if he responds to those interjections, sure. as he's aware. The Leader of the Opposition. We'll come back to the no, point Mr. Of order. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am keeping 
within the framework of a dissent motion. Leader of the Opposition, I have not frustrated you in no, any you way. Haven't. No, you and haven't. you will return to the motion and to no, the matter haven't. before the House. The standing orders when it comes to a, an objection to the Speaker's ruling are actually quite limited in terms of their coverage and therefore allow an argument to be made as to why it is relevant. The objection, if any objection in Standing Order 100 is taken to any ruling of the Speaker, such objection must be taken at once and a motion of dissent be submitted in writing, moved, which, if seconded, shall be proposed to the House and debate thereon shall proceed forthwith. Well, Mr Speaker, it is limited. I understand that. It is not limited to the point of ridiculousness, but it is limited to the necessity to make absolutely clear why the particular question is uh, relevant to the particular minister to whom it has been directed because that is the subject of the ruling in this case. And the point about uh, that, uh, that ruling, uh, which uh, we are contesting here, is that this minister has been answering questions on precisely these matters for some considerable period of time. And what was being done here was to do a compare and contrast with uh, what uh, was done in another FEC in response to precisely the same problem that he, as a minister himself, confronted. And so that went to the second paragraph. We dealt with the first paragraph, it went to the second. Are you also aware that the Ryan FEC pointedly refused to implement the scam on the basis that it was potentially illegal? Now, that particular scam has already been established as relevant to him. That particular scam, which operated in his FEC, was in fact a scam organised centrally by the state executive, which some electorate councils implemented and his did not. And he the member for Batman, the member for Kingsford Smith, the member for Batman. Both members are somewhat out of my range. The member for Batman, leader of the opposition. He has specific responsibility. He has specific responsibility for his and under his obligations as a minister of state. Under his, to deal truthfully with the public, under his obligations, under his obligations as a minister for small business to handle effectively the goods and services tax, under his obligations as a minister for small business to deal with the concerns that small business the have for is about the impact of the tax that is on them, and that is why we had. As that second position, are you also aware that the Ryan FEC pointedly refused to implement the scam on the basis that it was potentially illegal? And then it goes on in the final paragraph, which was rather lost in the welter of howling and screaming on the other side of the House. Minister, given the rank and file members in Ryan had the courage to stand up to your state office, why didn't you? Now, Leader of the House. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Well, I, I, might say, I might say, Mr Speaker, that the member for Prospect is now cooling her heels for not one half of what the I Leader of the House has been doing. Not one half of it. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, I so might I point out to the Leader of the Opposition that the member for Prospect had been warned earlier I, in question time. I repeat the, this paragraph, which they held down. Minister, given the rank and file members in Ryan had the courage to stand up to your state office, why didn't you, a senior Queensland Liberal MP? That really gets at the heart of it, Mr. Speaker. It really gets at the heart of it. Because what that shows is the latitude that was available to the minister to uphold his obligations under the code which the Prime Minister set down for ministers and why he is accountable in this place both on those grounds and also on the grounds of his status as Minister for Small Business, because it establishes with absolute clarity that latitude that he had. And therefore the question went on. As senior Queensland Liberal MP, did you not also have the courage and decency to shut down the Groom GST scam? Now, Mr Speaker, those are front and centre the questions that he has been asked in question after question in question time. 
And the reason we dissent from your ruling is that we have been, until this point, able to deal with that issue. Until this Leader point, we've been able to hold that minister accountable. But when it comes to a compare and contrast between people of some courage, gumption, knowledge and understanding and his own capacity, we are unable to ask him a question. We are unable to ask him a question about that. Now, Mr. Speaker, you operate in this chair under considerable duress. I've watched the Prime Minister put the you under the opposition. question time the leader today. Of the opposition but at the same time, time we are entitled to have our questions asked. Is, is the motion seconded? I second the motion. Reserve my right to speak. The member for Patterson. Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, the government uh, completely supports uh, your ruling. It was the only ruling available to you under the standing orders. Uh, we've just had one of the more pathetic presentations by the Leader of the Opposition. He used to be the Leader of the House. And it is incredible that someone who has had the job I've had for the last five and a half years has absolutely no idea whatsoever about the standing orders. And when he finds Remember himself under Patterson? a little bit of pressure, he moves a motion of dissent as a tactic when their plan today was, of course, to move a censure motion. Exactly. Well, Mr Speaker, I mean, this is just political ineptitude on an absolutely grand scale, a grand scale. And when finally he gets the chance to move his huge, politically moving, you know, incredible motion of dissent, he can't mount one argument, one argument in support of the, the proposition of the uh, which he thought Minister was for the, the, the Leader of the House will resume his seat. The member for Burke will excuse himself from the House under the provisions of 304A. The member for Chifley on a point of order. Uh, point of order, Mr. Speaker. Um, this is a uh, want of confidence in your ruling, and as has been pointed out, there's a very narrow remit. The member in for terms Chifley will resume argument. his seat. The Leader of the House. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the latitude which uh, is being uh, provided. Uh, not that I uh, have as yet uh, had recourse to that latitude in my remarks. The point I make to you, Mr. Speaker, is that, by way of general introduction, and that is that. There are standing orders. Uh, the standing orders have been applied by you very fairly, and when they are applied, uh, the government, of course, will support decisions which see their application. And on this particular case, it was as clear as night follows day. One of the clearest cases you could possibly get. And furthermore, Mr. Speaker, uh, it wasn't the first time today uh, that it was necessary for you to make the point that a question to a minister had to be about a minister's responsibilities. And even though they had had a question knocked out earlier in the day, uh, the, uh, the brilliance of the tactics team on the Labor Party side still couldn't work out. They, couldn't, you know, they weren't so adaptable, their tactics weren't so uh, flexible that they could actually take into account a ruling that you'd made earlier in the day and recognise that their last question, the one that was going to bring down the minister, the question that had all the great punch was in fact out of order, uh, yeah. Mr. Speaker. I mean, to, these these are the people, Mr. Speaker, with this uh, motion of dissent Minister against you, affairs. who uh, later this year are going to proffer themselves as the alternative government. Well, Mr. Speaker, what a sick joke! What a sick joke! They don't even and cannot even uh, present a case uh, just on uh, one of the most basic elements of running the house. Uh, namely the uh, standing order that relates to ministerial responsibilities. Let me, uh, let me refer to the standing order. Questions to ministers. Questions may be put to a minister relating to public affairs with which the minister is officially connected, to proceedings pending in the House or to any matter of any administration or, sorry, or to any matter of administration for which the minister is responsible. Questions may be asked orally without notice for immediate reply or in writing on notice and placed on notice paper for written reply. So, you know, if there was any substance to the dissent motion, Mr Speaker, 
uh, what the leader of the house, uh, what the op what the leader of the opposition would have done is he would have just, first of all, read out the standing order. That's what he would have done, uh, and then he would have read out his question and he would have related one to the other. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would myself refer to their question, uh, and I did ask the Labor Party would they mind passing me across a copy of their question just for the benefit of an informed debate. But no, this is the secret question. This is the secret question. This is the question that dare not be repeated. This is the question that can't possibly be passed over. Just as, uh, you, you wouldn't possibly pass it over. Why? Because the last thing you want me to do is simply relate your question to the standing orders. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I mean, this is just doubly pathetic. I mean, fancy, he's got a copy of it there, and I said to the manager of opposition, pass me over a copy, and he says, like a spoiled brat, he says, oh no, you can't have it. It's our question. You know, we're, we're so fond of our question. We're so fond of our question. We're not going to have. We're not going to let you have it available to you during uh, during a debate on a motion to dissent on the very question, the subject of this whole matter. I mean, Mr. Speaker, how juvenile can this uh, opposition be? A secret question sitting in the drawer. It's been revealed, never to be revealed again. What an embarrassment, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the uh, the Minister for Small Business. Uh, is a very good minister. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, even though I've been the minister for small business, I reckon he's one of the best ministers for small business we've had uh, that Australia has had for many years. And uh, why do I say that? Because uh, to be an effective minister for small business, Mr. Speaker, well, I am talking about the responsibilities, Mr. Speaker, of the minister for small business. The leader of the house will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. I make exactly the point of order, but this time with relevance from that was made when I was up here speaking. What on earth has that got to do with whether or not the question is within standing orders? That these are nice guys. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. And the best small seat. business minister the Leader the of the Opposition will resume his seat. The, I will respond to the point of order. The capacity of the Minister to do his job may have no direct relation to the censure motion of the Chair. But the reference to the Minister for Small Business is entirely relevant to the, the Leader. Mr Speaker, my point is exactly the same point that the Leader of the Opposition Dissent. made. Uh, when what he did was he attempted to enumerate the responsibilities of the Minister for Small Business. Well, having uh, put my forward my objections and having them overruled, Mr Speaker, I am, of course, entitled to exactly the same latitude. And the point I want to make about the Minister for Small Business is that uh, there's no question that he is a listening post for small business. There's, yeah, no, yeah. there's no question about that whatsoever. Excellent and actually, point. that is one of that is one of the strengths of his position. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's also true that if you read the Tax Act, he is not actually the minister that has administrative responsibility for the Tax Act. Uh, the person who has responsibility for that is either the Treasurer in respect of policy matters, or alternatively, and for very good reason, the Australian Tax Office. You see, it's a, it is a common complaint we have from the opposition uh, that they want the government to be personally responsible for each and every item of tax administration. But when Labor was in power and in the whole time that we have been in power, there has been a bipartisan view that when it comes to the actual administration of the Tax Act, the only way that that can properly be done to protect the interests of citizens is to have it done under the statutory authority of the Australian uh, of the Income Tax Assessment Act and the office holder, namely the Tax Commissioner. So, Mr. Speaker, the question you have to ask is: Well, are the tax affairs not of the Groom Federal Electric Committee, but of the Ryan Federal Electric Committee? Do these fall within? The ministerial responsibilities of the Minister for Small oh, Business. Well, Mr. Speaker, I mean, is, is there anyone really on the other side who is putting their hand up for that proposition? Well, of course you would, because you're so silly you've moved a motion of dissent and you will have no choice but to support that ridiculous proposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, they will put their hands up anywhere at any time if they think that they need to because of the consequences of their own conduct. Mr. Speaker, these people leave me breathless. They, they, leave, they virtually leave me without further to say. But I will fill up my another six minutes, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the 
the Leader of the House to resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the point of order is sticking close to the subject which is under yeah. deliberation, under but debate. You never did, so. I, the I Leader of the Opposition I will resume his seat. I stuck to it, as you know. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. I will listen to the I will listen closely to the Leader of the House, but my view is that to date he has been granted exactly the same latitude as was granted to the Leader of the Opposition. Leader of the House. So, Mr. Speaker, whilst uh, the Parliament uh, is concerned about um, the, uh, you know, the situation off Christmas Island, in question time today, so that was the issue in Parliament today for many people in the Parliament and many people in the public, you know, a, a matter of a, a real substance. The Labor Party's question, Mr. Speaker, and I refer to the motion of dissent. Their question is: Would you believe it's about seventy-five dollars and twelve cents? What? Yeah, I'm for real. No, it's not me for the real, leader, fellas. This is leader of the three House days. Will not respond to interjections. Well, three days, Mr. Speaker. Three days, Mr. Speaker. We have had the Labor Party on the warpath over over a matter of. $75.12, and that is sort of putting it at its highest. Because the fact is, as, uh, as the minister himself has said, in his own electric committee, when they held the function, they paid the caterer's bill and they paid the tax. You know, just, just, I know the facts get in the way, don't they, Mr Speaker? You know, when you're running a, when you're running a political campaign, whether it's three hours or five hours, whether you had to go to three hospitals or none, whether you were turned away or you weren't turned away, isn't it disappointing if you're in the Labor Party and the facts get in the way of the story? And, Mr. Speaker, the facts, the facts which uh, the leader of the opposition uh, needs to uh, somehow present—and of course there aren't any—in support of his argument uh, needs to counteract the fact that within the minister's own electorate committee, this whole issue, this so-called scam. I mean, I mean, I've heard of people who I've heard of uh, Bottom of the Harbour. That was a tax avoidance scheme. That was, you know, there were billions of dollars. I've heard of all sorts of schemes with the the thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, and millions of dollars at stake. You know, and, and hundreds of thousands of dollars from the trade union movement to the Labor Party. Now I call that a decent sort of scam and a fix. But Mr. Speaker, I tell you what. I've never heard of a scam worth $75.12. This must, if, if it were a scam, Mr. Speaker, this must be the most incompetent scam to have ever raised its head. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, I go back to I go back to standing order 142. I go back to standing order 140. The leader, leader of the house has the call. I go back to standing order 142. It has to relate to public affairs with which the minister is officially connected to or proceedings pending in the House or to any matter of administration for which the minister is responsible. Well, at no stage, at no stage was the Leader of the Opposition in fact able to refer matters within the, Groom, uh, the Ryan Federal Electric Committee uh, to those three headings under the standing orders for which the minister would be responsible. Um, I can understand, and we have a lot of, we've had a lot of questions about the minister's relationship with his own Federal Electric Council. And even though that's not sort of technically within his responsibility as a minister, remembering question time is for members of parliament, opposition or others, to bring a minister to account. That's the whole idea. It's, it's not you in your. It's the not a leader minister. of the house has the call. It's not. It's not an opportunity to ask the minister, uh, you know, how well he played golf on the weekend, uh, whether or not he's been successful in some other, you know, aspect of his or her life. Question time is to ask ministers to account for what they, as ministers, do, because that is that is how they sit on this side of the house. Uh, they have uh, they have responsibilities of managing and administering uh, those functions which are provided to them when they are appointed by the Prime Minister. That, that, is why we have, that is why ministers answer questions in question time and why the opposition uh, has under the standing orders a requirement to ensure that the question relates specifically not to the minister as a personality, as, and he is a personality, I should say. Uh, look at the tyre, look at the gravelly voice. 
uh, but Mr. Hear the gravelly voice, but Mr. Speaker, <laughs> these are questions which go to what the minister does as a minister. That is the reason that the standing order is, is there, and that is why there have been all sorts of questions over the years ruled out of order. Um, you know, the attitude, behaviour, or actions of a member of parliament or the staff of members, matters of a private nature not related to the public duties of a minister, just to quote two out of House of Reps practice. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the government is this is not a this is not a grey area. This this is the most sort of black and white uh, proposition that I've seen on a question of whether or not the question is uh, within uh, standing order 142. Uh, that is why, Mr. Speaker, without one without any hesitation, without a skerrick of hesitation, uh, the government, of course, will support your ruling. It was completely right. It was 110 per cent right. Uh, this is just a silly bit of tactics from the leader of the opposition, uh, who started this whole thing last week because he brought his uh, daughter into an issue, Order. and then he found that he was Order. scoring a the leader cheap of the House's political time point. Has expired. The, the question is: the question be put? All those without opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is the division required? Ring the bells. I hope the manager of opposition business's remarks are not being addressed through the chair. The manager of opposition business, I'm aware of.
Lock the doors. The question is that the question be put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. Point the honourable members for Tarangamite and Mallee tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong tell us for the noes. Order. The result of the division is I 76, no 60. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion of dissent from the Speaker's ruling be agreed with. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Is the division required? Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Would members please quickly assume the seats they wish to take for the vote.
Lock the doors. Indecision on the part of the member for Leichhardt and the member for Werriwa. The question is that the motion of dissent from the Speaker's ruling be agreed with. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Port Adelaide and Maribyrnong tellers for the ayes and the honourable members for Karangamite and Mallee tellers for the noes. Order. The result of the division is I 61, no 76. The question is therefore negatived. Would members please quickly and quietly resume their seats? <coughs> the Prime Minister. Further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank the Prime Minister. The Honourable Member for Adelaide. Speaker, I have a question. The Member for Adelaide has the call. Mr Speaker, I have a question for you, um, and I'm wondering if you may be able to report back uh, to the House if you have if you are not aware of this particular article. But in the financial review today, I noticed that uh, two of my colleagues were named as reading particular material uh, in the uh, in the chamber during question time. Now, I don't think it would be possible for uh, members in the press gallery to actually read. Uh, from that distance, the only conclusion that, are, that can be drawn is that the uh, high-powered uh, camera lenses uh, could pick up what was being read. Now, while what was reported today was harmless, it draws my attention to the fact. It draws the my member attention for to the Adelaide fact has the call. that uh, if members were dealing with constituent correspondence, as they often do in the chamber, then. Uh, what was written in that correspondence could also well be, uh, be read, and I think that is a serious matter, and I would ask you to investigate it. There are a series of guidelines that determine what the press gallery may or may not do, particularly what may or may not be photographed. I will take up the issues raised by the member for Adelaide with Mr Farr uh, of the press gallery. Chairman. The member for Mitchell on the same issue. I'll recognise the Chief Opposition Whip in just a moment, but the member for Mitchell has indicated he wants to deal with the same issue. Uh, Mr Speaker, this is the second occasion uh, an occurrence like this has been brought to the notice of the House. 
And I wonder whether you'd be so good as to examine the previous rules that applied to photography in the House, where only the person actually making a speech was eligible to be photographed from the gallery. Yes, I'm well aware of the rules. The Does the Treasurer want to make a comment on the same issue, with indulgence in this case? With, with indulgence, just on the same issue, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, could I draw to your attention that I think it was the Australian today had a photograph of the Minister for Small Business uh, sitting up. Uh, there on the front bench. The Treasurer has and, the call. Uh, Mr Speaker, it was a photograph which was— There are a was... number of members who have been warned and seem to have forgotten that discipline. It was a photograph which was most obviously taken the uh, the call. during the, uh, the censure debate. Uh, and, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, could you uh, report back to the uh, House whether or not uh, photographs are permitted to be taken during uh, uh, censure debates or any other debates? and uh, whether that complies with guidelines. And could you also report to the House, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, whether the caption that accompanied that uh, photograph was uh, accurate or not? And uh, also report to the House whether or not this uh, warrants any uh, revision of the uh, guidelines that have been given by you in relation to photographs. I should rep Not being assisted by a number of members on my left, I should inform the House that prior to my occupancy of this office, the guidelines with the gallery were renegotiated and are no longer in sync with the guidelines that apply to the Senate chamber. It is, the belief, it is my belief and the belief of the President of the Senate that the guidelines of both chambers should be identical. I would have thought that would be a matter that would be agreed by all members of the House and are currently being considered with Mr Farr. <laughs> Clearly, these, the existing guidelines and, I suspect, the previous guidelines are currently being abused, and I will take this matter up with whatever authority I have at my disposal. The Chief Opposition Whip. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My I have a question to you. You might recall that uh, some time ago DOFA changed the rules relating to travel allowance, which required those members who drove their vehicles to Canberra rather than come by aeroplane had to validate their, their arrival here by a number of ways, one of which was to sign a logbook that logged them into Canberra and then sign the logbook to log out of Canberra again. Um, a number of members on this side had been concerned about the way that that arrangement had been working, which was, as you may be aware, that a logbook was kept at the ministerial wing door, and <clears throat> a number of members had indicated that that logbook seemed to be moving from place to place in the ministerial wing, and it became very, very inconvenient for members. And uh, on behalf of the opposition, I wrote to uh, Minister Abetz and asked him if he would make arrangements to uh, see if those logbooks could be kept at the uh, House of Reps or Senate side door, because there's attendance there all the time. I received correspondence from Senator Abetz today, who told me that, um, that when this arrangement was put into place in 1998 by Minister Fay, that Minister Fay had asked the presiding officers um, to make those books available at the side doors, and the presiding officers advised that they were not prepared to implement such a system at the Senate and House of Representatives. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of members in, a, in an effort to facilitate members' arrangements, would you uh, look at reconsidering that situation and allow those logbooks, the logbook that members of the House of Representatives sign, to be kept at the House of Reps side door? My understanding and recollection is that we haven't attended there all the time, and um, if they kept the logbook and members could sign there, it is far more convenient for members than um, finding their way around the ministerial wing. And it's something that would help members uh, on both sides of the House. I'm not, I'm not f um, familiar with that decision, it having been taken before I became the Speaker. I will therefore consult with the President of the Senate to see if there were any reason why this particular regulation was put, was put in place. I cannot imagine why it would have been. I will happily report back to the House, but it would be my intention to do what I can, obviously, to facilitate the convenience of members. The member for Murray. I'd like to make a personal explanation. 
Does the member for Murray claim to have been misrepresented? In two ways, Mr Speaker. The member for Murray may proceed. Uh, Mr Speaker, in the report of the uh, House of Reps Hansard votes proceedings from yesterday, Monday 27th, the, in the grievance debate it's reported the member for Prospect accused me of having received or her having sent a piece of correspondence to me on the 3rd of August 2000 uh, that uh, described NHT applications from one of her constituent councils, and I hadn't responded to it. In fact, it wasn't the 3rd of August 2000 that the correspondence was sent. It was the 3rd of August 2001. I received it um, about four working days later, so it's in no way overdue in terms of response, but only a case that correspondence, which is an NHT application, has been sent the on for consideration. The member for indicated where she was being misrepresented. What was the, the other The second issue? was where the member for Prospect claimed that I, Minister Hill, had been picking and choosing grant recipients based on whether they were in a Liberal seat or not. Um, I would like to make the point, Mr Speaker, the Auditor-General Auditor Report number 42, which looked at these previous sorts of allegations from the opposition, found that the proportion of NHT funding and the projects approved for coalition and Labor seats closely match the proportion of the funding and projects recommended by the states and member territories. For, member for Murray, so there was no evidence the of bias in this allocation of funding. Thank you. Member for Batman. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd ask that in accordance with Standing Order 150, you write to the following ministers concerning long outstanding answers. I suppose it's the very issue going to accountability raised by the member, member for Murray. Member Batman knows that he will come to the list Mr. of Speaker, the indication of those questions. I'd first to go to a question placed on notice by me on the 16th of August 2000. Question 1819 to the minister assisting the Prime Minister concerning hospitality at the Sydney Olympics. I then go to a question placed on notice, Mr. Speaker, of the 9th of October 2000, to the Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Mr. Speaker, I then go to a question of the 5th of December 2000, question number 2215, to the Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Perhaps he'll give some of these answers in his statement tomorrow on regional <coughs> policy. Member for Batman. Mr Speaker, I then go to a question of the 1st of March 2001, question number 2416, to the Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Mr Speaker, I then go to a question of the 27th of March 2001, to the uh, Minister for Transport and Regional Services, question number 2471. Mr Speaker, I then go to a question of the 22nd of May 2001 to the Minister for Transport and Regional Services, question 2559. I go to question 2560 of the 22nd of May 2001 to the Minister for Transport and Regional Services. I go to question number 2561 of the 22nd of May 2001 to the Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Mr Speaker, I then go to the 23rd of May 2001, question number 2581. I know Mr Foreign Affairs thinks this is a call. joke. It's about accountability, Mr come. Speaker. No, Mr Batman will come to the list of questions. Mr Speaker, question number 2581 to the Prime Minister concerning wine missing from the Curabilly cellar. Member for Batman Mr Royal Speaker, I then go to question number 2582 of the 23rd of May 2001 to the Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Question number 2601 of the 4th of June 2001 for the Minister for Transport and Regional Services. And finally, Mr Speaker, question number 2646 of the 6th of June 2001 to the Minister for Transport and Regional Services. I would appreciate some answers, Mr Speaker. I assure the member for Batman that I will follow up those matters as the standing orders provide. The honourable member for Cornwall. Yes, Mr Speaker, I've also got the concern about question 2644 to the Minister for Transport and Regional Services pertaining to uh, Tullamarine Airport. Question number Very important. And issue the of Tullamarine Airport and noise levels at Member Tullamarine Airport. Member for Cornwell is outside the standing orders. Member for Cowan. Mr Speaker, Member given Australia's... Member for Cowan, I should indicate to the Member for Cornwall, as I failed to do, that I will follow up the question with the Minister. His only obligation was to My nominate the 
number and date of the question. The member for Cowan. Mr. Speaker. Given Australia's uh, magnificent win in the Ashes uh, series, concluded in the very early hours of uh, this morning Australia time, will you, uh, on behalf of the Australian Parliament, write to the Australian cricket team congratulating them on their series win and for the tremendous spirit of fair play and good sportsmanship in which they played the game? I will be happy to facilitate the wishes of the House. I would be surprised if this matter hadn't already been pursued by the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, and I'm happy to either join them or do it independently as is appropriate. Presentation, presentation of papers. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The papers are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. I move that the House take note of papers numbers three and four. Full details of these papers will be recorded in the votes and proceedings in Hansard.